Mr. Buffett, uh, my name is Pete Brown from Columbus, Ohio, uh, Class B shareholder. I had a couple questions if I could. Um, the first is um, I, I don't have a very good idea in my mind how our typical insurance operations work. I mean, in particular, how money leaves the insurance pool and enters the investment pool and how our operations are different than the typical run-of-the-mill insurance operation you know, around the country. Why are we able to generate so much more float than than you know the XYZ company you know somewhere else, and the second question is um, it, it kind of goes back to an article you wrote for Fortune magazine back in the late 70s um, about the effect of inflation on on uh, equity values and, and that sort of thing. And in it, you asserted that uh, stocks were and businesses were really like bonds; um, they just had their own par, and the par being the average 12% return on equity that companies have averaged. Um, you know, a company that does better than that has assets that are worth way more than 100 cents on a dollar. A company does less, you know, will be less correspondingly. Um, my question is, when you're projecting cash flows of a company uh, as a prospective investment, why would you use the uh, going insur or interest rate, um, you know, of, of, of risk-free uh, treasury bills? Why wouldn't you use the sort of opportunity cost to discount it that maybe Charlie was referring to, maybe 12% return on equity of average corporations, maybe you know your 15% goal, maybe Coca-Cola's return on equity is a comparison. I mean, doing that would dramatically change the value of the company that you're that you're you know evaluating. As I'm sure you know, why would you use the risk-free rate? Is my question. The risk-free rate is used merely to equate one item to another. In other words, we're looking for whatever is the most attractive, but. In, in terms of present valuing anything, we've got to, we, we're going to use a number, and, and obviously we can always buy the government bond, so that that becomes the yardstick rate. It doesn't mean we want to buy government bonds. It doesn't mean we want to buy government bonds if the best thing we can find is only has a present value that uh, works out at a half percent a year better than the government bond. But it, it's the appropriate yardstick, in our view, to simply use to compare across all kinds of investment opportunities, oil wells, farms, whatever it may be. Uh, now it gets into degree of certainty too, but that, but it it is it, it's the yardstick rate. It's not it's not because we want to buy government government bonds, but it does it does serve to make that a constant throughout the valuation process. Uh, yep. In our insurance business, we really have a group of insurance businesses, and and. They have different characteristics. Uh, the consistent characteristic, actually, is that they're all very, very good businesses. Some of them are a lot larger and have opportunities to get larger, and some of them are not so large and, and have limited opportunities in terms of growth. But every insurance operation we have is a distinct asset to Berkshire. Uh, we've got smaller, a workers' comp operation. We've got we've got a, a, a credit uh, operation, credit card operation. We've got a home state operation. We have all these different business: Kansas Bank Insurance, whatever. They're all good businesses. Some of them do, don't develop a lot of float relative to uh, uh, premium volume. Uh, uh, the nature of Kansas Bank Insurance is that it won't develop a lot of float. It just happens to be the kind of business they write. The nature of comp is that it develops more float because comp claims pay more slowly. Uh, we, you really should think of each one of those having different characteristics. Geico is, is entirely different than the super cat business. They're both good businesses. In terms of how we invest the money when it comes in, we invest it when it comes in. I mean, it, it is, it, we'll get a large super cat premium today, it's invested. Now, if we have a claim tomorrow, then we disinvest, you know, and, and in a substantial way. If you take something like Geico, the cash flow is always going to be positive, probably, on that. You know, we won't have another Hurricane Andrew because we backed out of the homeowner's business to quite an extent. So month by month, the money comes in at a GEICO, and the faster it grows, the more the money that comes in. We have so much capital that we can basically put that money into whatever makes the most sense for Berkshire. So we have none of the either the mental or psychological constraints or, the, or regulatory constraints that 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 the uh, that many insurance companies uh, operate under. That many of them think they sort of should have this portion and this and this portion and that and so on. 
Investments usually play second fiddle to the insurance business at most companies that are in the insurance business. We look at them as being of equal importance uh, and we run them as two distinct businesses. We do whatever makes the most sense on the investment side, whatever makes the most sense on the insurance side. We never do anything on the investment side that will impinge on our business on the in insurance side. But you really should look at each one of our businesses separately. GEICO has entirely different characteristics than the Supercat business. They both call themselves insurance. They both develop float. But in economic terms and in terms of competitive strengths and that sort of thing, they're two, two very different businesses. And our smaller businesses are different businesses. Some of those may grow reasonably well. We'll, we'll keep working on it. Charlie? Yeah. That, that, if you, you look at a corporate stock, it's obvious you can buy any maturity of government bond you want. So one opportunity cost of buying the stock is to compare it with the bond. Well, you may find that half the stocks in America you're so fearful about or know so little about or think so poorly of that you, you'd rather have the government bond. So on an opportunity cost basis, they're taken out of the filter. Now you start finding corporations where you like the stocks way better than, than government bonds. You've got to compare them one against the other. And when you find one that you regard as the best opportunity, that you can understand as the best opportunity, now you've got one to buy. It's a very simple idea. It uses nothing but the most elementary ideas from, from, uh, from economics or game theory. It's, it's just, it's, it's child's play as a mental process. Now it's hard to make the business appraisals, but the mental process is essential. If Charlie and I were forced, told we had a choice of buying stock A, B, C, or D, and all 2,500 or 3,000 or whatever may be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, or buying a 10-year government bond and we had to hold the stock for 10 years or the bond for 10 years, probably in at least 80% of the cases we'd, we'd take the 10-year government. You know, in many cases because we didn't understand the business well enough elsewhere, or secondly, we may understand it and still prefer the 10% government. So, but we would measure everything that way. And, and uh, I don't know, what, did you come up with 80% or where, Charlie? Desert Island, 10 years? Get to fondle a stock certificate or fondle a government bond? Which one are you going to choose? <laughs> but anyway, I think life is a whole series of opportunity costs. Uh, you know, you've got to marry the best person who is convenient to find who will have you. you know, it's, <laughs> it, it, investment is much the same sort of a process. I knew we'd get in trouble after lunch. <laughs>